Hey, I'm really, really glad you're here. Today's going to be a really special day, a time of celebration, a time of commitment. Um, but first, will you just join me in um, just giving everyone a big shout out to all of our campuses today. Just say welcome, everyone at Aberdeen, Edgewood, Abingdon, Mountain Road, online. Glad you're with us, okay? So back in the day, a few years back, my daughter Ellie talked me into something that I uh, came to regret. Um, she, we're on vacation in Minnesota, and she says, um, hey, Dad, wouldn't it be cool to, like, run this triathlon? And I'm like, I th thought about it for, like, a nanosecond. Like, no, no, that would not be, no. And then she did the kid thing, you know, where you manipulate. gives a kid hack for you here. You know, you know where I'm going with this, right? She's like, but, oh, Dad, I thought it was something we could do together. I'm like, oh, jeez. <laughs> So she got me, and the next thing I know, I'm signed up for this thing, and you know, I got proof. Here I am at the, at the beginning of the race. You know, I look pretty good there, you know, kind of happy still. Uh, but uh, the faithful day, you know what a triathlon is, right? Basically, they throw you in the water, and they ask you to swim approximately forever, and then it's like impossible, and there's waves in, in this lake, and people clawing at you. I had my, I was trying to wear this wetsuit thing. And uh, I had it on backwards. I didn't know. And the cushy part was on the wrong side, so I was pulling my rump up as I was swimming, putting my head down. It was horrible. And then, and then when you're done with that, then you get out and you peel off stuff and you get on a bike and you just briskly ride for, I think this was like 12 miles. It was just a little one. And then, um, and then you get off af having completed the rubberization of your legs and then you, um, you just go for a little 5K uh, jaunt. And um, if you don't die from all that, you know, then, then you congratulate yourself. I, just thinking about the whole thing was intimidating, it was daunting, it was bigger than, you know, something I had done before. But as we thought about the whole thing, I really had one goal. What do you suppose my goal was? Finish. Right, yeah, yeah. Other than not dying, yes. <laughs> to finish, just to finish. So here's a question. How do you complete a race like that? One step at a time. One step at a time. Exactly. You know, you, one one. One stroke at a time, one pedal at a time, one step. No, everyone does a race like that in exactly the same way. Nobody does it all at once. You do it one step at a time. If you're too focused on the finish line, you're going to trip and fall right in front of you. You've got to pay attention. But if you're only looking at the step in front of you and forgetting the finish line, you'll probably get discouraged and quit. So it's kind of a mixture of both of those, one step at a time while remembering where you're going. And I tell you all that because... <clears throat> About a year ago, God put this kind of challenge, this long, hard race out in front of us, and it was kind of intimidating, to be honest. It was like daunting and, and uh, seemingly impossible for us when we saw the God-sized dream that was planted in front of us. But we just knew, ha, ah, we had to do it. It was like we, had, we, were, we were still kind of recovering from that crazy COVID stuff, and it's like, you know what? Um, we've, we've got to reach more people. We, we've got to get back on track and, and make this church everything that God wants it to be. We've got to reach more kids. We've got to reach more students. We've got to do more for young adults. We've got to do something for mental health. We've got to, you know, we just had all this stuff. We've got to do more for the epicenter. And we just felt like God is really calling us to do it. And it was daunting. It was the biggest thing we've ever tried to do in our 199-year history. And I've got to tell you, over the last year, y'all have been amazing. Because every day, step by step by step, we've been running that race. And when you show up to worship, when you invite someone, when you serve in kids, when you pray a prayer, when you are on in your mission, in, in wherever you work or go to school, when you give generously, when you, when you are here and you're in it for good, it makes a difference and God's done some crazy good stuff. And we're moving forward. I mean, we've celebrated some of it, um, but it's just worth noting again that we have so much to be really thankful for and, and to just note in a time when so many churches are really struggling and there's so much negative press about just Christianity as a whole, the amazing good that God has enabled us to do. Guys, it's, just, it's so great. Attendance is up about 30% over uh, a year. It's our largest year of, of growth uh, ever in the history of this church, you know. We've had over 2,000 first-time guests. We've got like 481, 482 baptisms. Uh, more than 3,000 people are studying the Bible every week in a small group. We started like 30 new groups. 20 more are going to start in January. 
kids and students' ministries are growing like by 20%. Young adults is growing. Sports is growing. The epicenter is expanding. I say all that just to say, man, there's so much. The explosions of good we've been able to do to, to, to help the local women's center and Tabitha's house and FCA, Fellowship of Christian Athletes, Habitat for Humanity. Um, you know, the stuff we're doing in Kenya and around the world. So God's doing good, y'all, and the generosity and the serving and everything that you've done has really, really mattered. But we're not there yet, right? We're sort of like getting out of the water and maybe halfway through the, the, the bike ride because there's more to come, right? So it's just the reason we pause with this whole series is to just say, you know what? Well done. It's like someone on the sidelines just cheering, like you keep going. You're not there yet, but keep going. And um, we we want to know that um, we want God to know and the community to know that we're we're not done. We're going to keep running with it. So um, you know, some of you who who maybe read my blog or or um, if you sign up for um, Ben's notes online or whatever, you probably saw I, I, did, I just did a short little article about um, something called like my one of my favorite holidays that nobody knows about called All Saints Day. And it's just a time to remember, well, first of all, remember what a saint is, is any believer in Jesus Christ. And All Saints Day is a day to remember those saints and faithful Christians who have really inspired us and who've been encouraging to you in your own walk of faith. And there might be someone famous, like, you know, a Billy Graham or, you know, the Apostle Paul, or, or, or an author or something like that. But you know what, it might be, it might be just an ordinary obscure person that's special to you because of how they really encouraged you to grow in God, you know, and, and, and whose life still speaks and who's, upon whose shoulders we stand today. Is someone coming to mind for you like that? Some of you are so thankful because they help pass on the faith to you. Maybe, they, maybe it was a grandmother, you know, or a Sunday school teacher, somebody like that that invested in you. For me, I can't help but think of my dad, who, who just passed a few months ago, you know, but I'm so grateful for him. The saints, the saints are all of those believers who came before us, and it includes all those who are going to come after us. And so as I thought about that whole thing in relation to what we're doing here as a church, it kind of struck me, you know, we're kind of the middleman in that equation, you know, because there are those who have run the race of faith before us at Mountain. They were faithful in their time, and they have handed to us, like, if you're here today, there's a baton in your hand <laughs> that's been handed to us, and this is our moment to be faithful and run with it, because there are those who God would want to come after us that only will come after us if we are faithful in this moment and run our race of faith and hand it to them, and that's true in your personal life. As there are, you know, people that you know that are counting on you, need to count on you. Or, and it's also true, you know, with us as a church. Because we're only here, you know. You think about all the ministries of Mountain and, and, and the, camp, the buildings we're sitting in. You know, the campuses and the pastors. All, it didn't just pop up out of nowhere. It's the result of some faithful, sacrificial, serving, loving, praying, and faithfulness over a long period of time of those who came before. And if there are going to be people after us, um, well, that has to do with how well we run with it in this strategic moment in time where God has entrusted the baton of faith to us. When I think back 200 years of our history as a church, I don't know that they ever would have imagined a mountain as it is today, you know, all the impact and the thousands of people that have been reached and all of that. But I know this. I know that what they did then matters now, doesn't it? And I know that what we do now will matter to people who will hopefully someday look back and say, I'm so thankful for those crazies in 2023 who were faithful, even in a crazy time, in an election year, in a, you know, in all, all, all of the stuff going on that, that is crazy in our world. I know it'll matter, and I've been praying that it'll matter to thousands that otherwise would not be part of God's kingdom. In fact, check this out. Last week, last week we've been talking about Abraham, right? And uh, we talked about how Abraham was asked to sacrifice his son Isaac, right? 
And so he gets to that fateful moment up on top of that mountain where he's literally raising the knife in obedience, ready to do this. And God calls to him from an angel and says, stop, hold it right there. You've passed the test. And, and what I didn't share with you is the next verses. Take a look at this. It's Genesis chapter 22. I think verse 15 and following, it says this, The angel of the Lord called Abraham from heaven a second time and said, this is God speaking now, I swear by myself, declares the Lord. That's kind of always strikes me funny. I promise, so help me, me. You know, uh, I swear, I swear, God's make a promise here, that because you have done this, you've trusted and you've obeyed, and you have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants, check this out, as numerous as the stars in the sky. Here's this man with only one son, and God says, it's going to happen. I now know I can trust you. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Do you see how powerful that is? Because of Abraham's trust and obedience, God multiplies descendants like stars in the sky, and those descendants included a family that would eventually birth Jesus Christ, and because of him, we are invited into that same family, which means, it gives me chills to say, you and I are some of those stars that God was talking about. We're sitting here today as some of those stars. See, we're only here because by the grace of God, Abraham received that promise, and, and through his trust, God delivered, and those descendants, we're some of those stars, and it's mind-blowing to think, you know, that there are stars that God wants to put in the sky later that will only come as a result of our faithfulness. It's a beautiful image, isn't it? And if you're, I just want to say, if you're a guest here today, and you're, you're here at a great time, because you're going to get a great taste of what really blows our hair back, like what gets us excited around here, and what we're all about as a church. And the bottom line is we just really believe that this blessing that God gave to Abraham and through him has come through Christ to us and that we ourselves are super blessed. But we're blessed, like Abraham, to be a blessing, not just for our own sakes. And that includes and starts with us just devoting our lives to Jesus Christ, not just with our lips, but with our very lives. And if you're new here, you know, later we're going to have a moment where we're all invited and encouraged to, to sort of express that love and belief to God in the form of a commitment on this card you've got right in front of you. And if you're new here, you shouldn't feel obligation to do that, but you're invited, you're welcome to. And our prayer is that you will one day have your heart so gripped by the love of Jesus that you, you will say, I, I, I consider it a joy and a privilege like we do to jump in on mission around here too, okay? So over the last four weeks... We've been looking at the life of Abraham. Why do you always mumble when you answer me? Come on. It makes it sound like a boring sermon series. Over the last four weeks, we've been studying the life of Abraham. Exactly. And uh, we've learned a lot of important lessons from him. And uh, we're going to just try to pick up a little bit more today. Uh, quickly reviewing, we've seen so many things like we saw at the beginning when God called him, it was like a pull out of his comfort zone and everything familiar that he knew and loved. And often that's the way it is with us. There's a step that we have to take. We learned that God wanted to bless all nations through him, that, that this was for everyone, even though it started through him. And that he would need to trust God, even when he didn't understand. Sometimes you've got to close your eyes and take his hand. And that's true for us as well, isn't it? And we learned that you've got to be careful not to get stuck part way. Sometimes we start following God and then we just kind of stop. And we, got, we learned that that's, that's a real danger. We learned that Abraham was a man filled with a lot of failure, a lot of fear. And despite all that, God was faithful to him. And he calls us to be faithful to him as well, even through tests that give us an opportunity to trust him. And you just summarize all of the lessons so far. It seems like it comes down to this, that God is faithful. He's so, so good. And every day he's been faithful and that he wants to know, will you and I be faithful to him? Because when there's a trust relationship between God and his people, that's the avenue that all the generations will be blessed through. So it really comes down to this trust thing, the faithfulness of God, and then our responding to that, like, will you trust, will you obey? 
Will you put him first? In a word, it's commitment. So today's the day to think about your commitments, okay? You heard about the chicken and the pig that were going out for breakfast? Going to go grab a bite? And the chicken suggests, well, why don't we just, uh, why don't we just you know, do bacon and eggs? And the pig thinks about it for a second goes, oh, wait a second. For you, that's just a contribution. But for me, that's a real commitment. And there, there's a difference, right? And this kind of in a tongue-in-cheek sort of way reminds us of the call that Jesus, I mean, the BLT translation of the Bible, um, that's the Ben's Living Translation, says um, God's not looking uh, for chickens, he's looking for pigs. Yeah, and so someone examined your life and really the way you participate in the things of God, the way you're responding to the call of God, the way you're trusting and obeying. Are you a chicken or a pig? What do you bring into breakfast? So we want to, with that in mind, draw out three things from Abraham's life of faith that will really help us in ours, okay? You game? Here we go. Number one, if you're following along in the booklet, you got your booklet with you and you're taking notes there, it's page 37. All right. First thing, your commitment reveals something about your character. Think about it. Show me what you're committed to and I'll tell you a lot about the nature of who you are. Our commitments reveal that, don't they? Abraham was so far from perfect. This guy was filled with flaws. He was a sinner, but he was faithful and he trusted God and he was committed to those things. And God said, that's enough. You're good with me. So he made all these mistakes and despite all that sin, he committed and that reveals enough of his true character that God said, I can use that. And that's the, that's the thing we've got to cling to. And God put him to some real tests to actually reveal that character. And God will do the same with you and me. That's why our own faithfulness, um, in a practical way, always includes some kind of test where God is going to ask obedience. He doesn't just want us to sort of like talk to him. He wants to see it lived out in our lives. So that's why faithfulness and commitment like this always is going to include, all through the Bible, it includes our treasure, the Bible used that word treasure, you know, or our, we would just say our finances, because that's what we value so much, and that's what often reveals who we are and what we're committed to. It just does. Look how Jesus teaches about this in Matthew 6. Matthew 6, kind of a common sense teaching, but he does it in a creative way. He says, now, don't store up treasure, so, you know, don't put all your treasures uh, down here on the earth with, with stuff that, because moths will eat it and rust will destroy it and thieves will break in and steal. It's the temporary kind of stuff. Instead, he says, store your treasures in heaven. Like, like have the, your treasure invested in God's stuff because there no moth or rust or thief can, can touch it. And then how does he end it? He says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And it's important to pay attention to what he's saying here about treasure. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart truly is. He doesn't say, well, where your heart is, you know, well, then put your treasure there. He's saying, no, he's saying, I can tell you where your heart is because it's following your treasure. Wherever you put your treasure, your heart's going to follow. And that reveals your character like something really essential about you. And the interesting thing is it kind of works in reverse as well. When I make a commitment to something with my treasure, guess what happens to my heart? My heart follows it, right? Like the first investment I ever made years ago was in Walmart. And I never paid attention to Walmart before, but after I made a tiny little investment, guess who's looking at the paper to see how Walmart's doing on the market, right? Why? Because where your treasure is, your heart goes, And so whatever you give your treasure, if your treasure first and foremost goes to bass fishing, that's where your heart will be. If your treasure first and foremost goes to Old Navy fashion, that's where, that's where, you know, your your heart will be also. Put your treasure there and your heart will follow. And so that's why I think Jesus is teaching this. He's like, because he's all about our heart. He doesn't need our money. He, you know, what's he going to do with that? He He doesn't, he himself doesn't need our money, but he does want our hearts. And so he says... Put your generosity, your treasure in the things of God, like into my mission, into my kingdom, into, he calls it, you know, the things of heaven, 
so that you can feel that, and your heart then is going to be joined with me. It will be joined with my mission and with me, and that will reveal something deep about you. So that's the first lesson. You know, your commitments really do reveal your character. So when you put your treasure with the things of God, your heart's going to be closer to the heart of God, to the things of God, to the mission of God, and, and therefore the blessing of God. So your, 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 your commitments reveal your character. Second, the thing we can learn here is that your generosity, as we look at, as we look at Abraham's life, you see that generosity reveals priorities. We already know this, don't we? Where you choose to invest, think about your time. Where you're generous with your time says a lot about what's important to you, right? We don't have so many hours in the day. And so when we give time to something, well, we've revealed that's important to us. And it's the same with our money. It doesn't matter how much money we have or don't have. The principle is the same. When, whether it's super tight and you've got more month than money or you're a quad billionaire or whatever, it's the same principle. Whatever you're committed to um, gets paid first. So, so for me, as I would want to say, oh, I want to become more like Jesus in my life, I, all, we have, all we have to do on this principle is look at God. And, and, of course, one of the scriptures we know so dearly says this, God so loved the world that he gave. He gave. Why? Because we were his priority. That's why. Jesus gave his very life for us. Why did he do that? Because we were a priority and he proved that. So you see how this works? Like you can give without loving. People do that all the time. But you can't really love without in some way giving. And so even though giving and generosity kind of runs counter, it's not the American dream, it is the Christian call. And we're never more like God than when we give and prioritize, you know, God first. And, and so God really cares about our priorities, doesn't he? And, and, and that's why the Bible unapologetically just says, hey, put me first and asks for our giving to reflect that with our first and best gifts. And it's always been this way from the beginning. You remember we, we, we talked about Cain and Abel. Uh, they were the, you know, Adam and Eve's um, boys, and they each wanted to give a gift to God, and Abel's the one who comes, and he blesses the Lord first, off the top, with the first and best that he had, and Cain, his brother, on the other hand, you know, he kind of takes care of everything else first. I got to have my Wi-Fi, my pedicure, pay my rent, go to Starbucks, you know, I got to do all this stuff, gas money, I need all this stuff, and then if there's anything left over, God, I want to honor you with what's left, and the haunting verse to me is where is the scriptures that, that say then that God accepted and approved of Abel's off-the-top gift, but he actually rejected and refused Cain's gift. And you're like, well, God, you should be thankful for whatever you get. And God's like, that's not the way I look at it. And God, so God's kind of teaching us through that passage in the beginning of the Bible. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not a God who's into leftovers and being an afterthought. He's looking for commitment and trust where he is demonstrated to be the first and the best. So who or what gets the first and best in your life? Your time, your talent, and your treasures. These are really big questions. And God says at the very beginning, Ten Commandments, put no other gods before me. Put me first. And the reason he can ask that is that he didn't send leftovers to us. You know, he didn't send the B team or the JV squad down here to help. He sent his son. He sent his very best. He sent his son whom he loved. And when God sent his son, he sent his first and best, and he asked us to do the same. So our generosity reveals our priorities. And the third thing that we can pick up here is that your commitments, and, and specifically this commitment we're talking about today, it, it, it's kind of our way of answering the question that God's always asking us, and that is, will you trust me? You know God's asking you that question right now. Like, will you trust me? And, and so he's not particularly impressed with words. <laughs> That's why he kept putting Abraham to the test. It's why he keeps putting you and me to the test. Like, there's, like I'm going to help you demonstrate this trust for me. Abraham, 
I need you to leave. Abraham, I'm going to give you a son. Abraham, don't worry, I got it. Abraham, sacrifice your son. All of it was a way of God asking, will you trust me? And the Bible says what Abraham did is he believed and he trusted and he followed God. And God's asking the same thing of us. Will you trust me? So that's partly why we said yes to launch in this Parkville campus because we know it's a stretch, it's a challenge, but we know if we trust God, it'll happen. And it won't happen if we don't. And it feels like that's just the right space to be in. Have you guys ever heard of a, um, a guy named Charles Blondin? He was, a, uh, like in the 1800s, a tightrope walker. Anybody ever heard of this guy? 1859, he shows up at Niagara Falls with a two-inch uh, round rope in diameter, and it's 1,100 feet, and he stretches it across Niagara Falls, ties it onto each end, and announces that he's going to cross the Niagara Falls walking on a tightrope with nothing but this 30-foot-long, 50-pound pole. And it was a huge media circus. I mean, everyone shows up. Every, everyone's there. And, of course, nobody thought he could do it. You know, they thought this guy's crazy. He's a bit of a nut. He's foolhardy. He's, we're going to watch this guy die. And, um, you know, so the moment comes, you know, and kids are grabbing onto their mama's legs. And we actually have a picture. Here's a picture of Charles Blondin crossing uh, the, uh, the Niagara Falls in 1859. And he just takes off halfway down the cable. And when he gets halfway, he sits down on it, and he takes a rope and drops it down to the Maid of the Mist boat down below. They tie a bottle of wine. He pulls it back up and drinks it and finishes it, walks all the way back. The crowd goes nuts. Blondin, Blondin, they love this guy. Well, that was the first of uh, many different trips that this guy made across, every one of them a big spectacle. Um, he took a camera strapped to his back, a big one with a monopod. He gets halfway out there and he pulls it off and he sets it on there and he takes a picture of the crowd, you know, looking at him. And uh, this guy made so many trips across. He did somersaults. He did backflips. He went backwards. This guy did it at night. He did it with shackles. He, one time he took a table and chair, set up the table, balanced it, sat in the chair, put his feet up on the table, and, uh, you know, ate some cake in front of everybody. This guy, this guy one time took a stove. This guy, think about this. Took a stove out there, started a little fire on his rope, cooked an omelet, and sent it to the boat down below. Everyone's like, blonde in, blonde in. One day, particularly, they were all worked up. And he's talking, to the, yelling to the crowd before he crosses this time. He goes, do you think I can do it blindfolded? They're like, we believe, yes, yes, Blondin. He puts a gunny sack over his head, goes all the way, comes back. He says, do you think I can do it, you know, in a gunny sack? And they're just like, we believe, Blondin, Blondin. And he, sure enough, you know, he hops all the way across the darn thing. He says, do you think I can push a wheelbarrow? And they're like, yes, Blondin. And he does it, comes back with a wheelbarrow. He says, do you think I could put a person in this wheelbarrow? And walk them all the way across the back. They're like, yes, we believe, Blondin, Blondin. He says, who will get in the wheelbarrow? <laughs> and all of a sudden, uh, you know, a hush fell over a very quiet crowd, you know, because there are certain moments when our trust is really put to the test. When it becomes clear in our relationship with God, whether we're a fan or truly faithful, and, and what we've learned from Abraham is that here's an ordinary sinful guy, a lot like us, who trusted God. He, the dude got in the wheelbarrow, man. He, he did it. He believed God's promises to bless him and others were important. And he staked his life on it. And God never let him down. And that's how Abraham kept being able to trust him, even when it was hard and everyone thought he was crazy. So Abraham was faithful. And the question is, you know, you know will, what will you say when God says, will you trust me? Will you trust me? Will you be faithful? Like, will you get in the wheelbarrow? And God has, to us, proven his faithfulness as well. In your own life, every day, he's been faithful and so, so good. And, and he's proven it most of all in Jesus Christ. I mean, what more could he do? And we're like, yes, 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 we love you, and let's do more. You know, God, 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 we love, we're all, we're, we're all believers. And he's just like, yeah, that's great. Will you get in the wheelbarrow? You know, it's just a game changer. And again, he's proven himself. And there's nothing more he could do to prove that. And so now is, now is that, you know, one of those moments for us. Will you trust me with your life?
And so for us, this is why Jesus repeatedly teaches on generosity, because it's our way of separating our good intentions from actual faith. Because you can't fake it. You can fake everything else. You can't fake this. So in just a little bit, we're going to think about what that would look like for us. But for right now, um, I'd love for you just to hear from some friends of ours. Uh, Jeff and Kathy Costa have been wrestling and thinking over the last year about what God's been doing in their life. And I'd just like you to listen to their story as you also think about your own story. So go ahead and watch the screen. When you start giving that's when you start feeling it. And when you have it to give and you see how it changes people's lives. um, You give it. That just makes you want to give more. I didn't know anything about Christ when I first came to Mountain. Jeff was uh, was Catholic, was Catholic, so he learned that through going to Catholic school and things like that. So... In my opinion, we had a really nice relationship already. Mm -hmm. Um, But when we started to grow in Christ, that's when things started getting better and better and better. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's really made a huge impact in our lives, and it's a wonderful thing. Do you remember that night, Vision Night? I remember it well. When you changed the numbers? Yes, Yes, I changed the number, and (laughs) why I changed the number is because... I didn't trust God enough. And when we went to that that um, unstoppable good rally that they had and Ben was talking and he said, you know, you trust in God so much. Trust in God in this. Come up with a number that, uh, that, that you have to really go out and, re- and say, God, help me on this because we don't know if we can do it. Right. And so far, one year in, I'd have to say we've made out more than we ever expected. Yeah. We, we, whenever we give, we get back. It is guaranteed. It's not money coming back necessarily, but we always seem to have it when we need it, whatever the case may be. But when we give, we get back over and over again. It, always worked out. God always gave us what we needed to give to others. And then in so doing, we got so much back from God. It is just like unreal what has happened in our life, how we have transformed and look forward to times when we can give. You know, when you're just looking around and you see people and, and things like that, it's just like, I can help there. We trust We trust in Mountain. We trust what Mountain is doing in our community. And we know God is so needed in our community more so now than ever. Um, So when we give, we know Mountain, we feel like Mountain is doing the right things with everything that that we give. So we trust in Mountain and we trust 100% Christ. I love what giving did to our relationships. One of the things is we, we, we facilitate groups. We're not always in the same group. We started in the same group, but, and then we sit there uh, the night before with our Bibles opened and we go back and forth. Uh, what's the best plan um, that we could use in, in, in our groups? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that's just lovely. God's kingdom is growing right on out of mountain. And it, it is a beautiful thing and it's taken off. It's just, it's amazing. Yeah, grateful for friends who can share some of their story. It just helps us think about our own, you know, our own story and the things we're wrestling with. Hey, in case you're wondering, Ellie and I did finish that triathlon. Um, in fact, uh, you know, it's not surprised that she came flying across the finish line. When I finally did, I came dragging across the finish line. Uh, but I did make it. My legs were numb. It wasn't easy. And I didn't look nearly as fresh at the end as I did at the beginning. I got my tongue hanging out there, you can see. But um, somehow, um, well, since you asked, we did manage to each of us medal in our age bracket. So there you go. Don't ask how many people were in my age bracket. You know how we did it, right? One step at a time. 
And there's a scripture verse that says, um, he who began a good work in you will see it through to completion. Mountain, God began a good work in you personally and in us in the church. And I think he wants to see it through. See it through to completion and uh, now is our time uh, to run with it. And we do it the same way, one step at a time. So one prayer at a time, one show up at a time, one care about your neighbor in Jesus' name at a time, one serving at a time, one invitation at a time, one generous gift at a time, because it all adds up in God's economy to do amazing stuff. And you will continue to be blessed so that we can together, what, be a blessing. So what's your part? Well, uh, there are really three groups of people, and at this moment, I'd like you to reach for that card, the commitment card. There's one for every single person. My goal is that every single one of us here today would take a moment with God and this card. And to flip it open to the inside, on the right-hand side, where it says, you know, calculate here, there are three boxes. They kind of represent three different people, but the, the first group of us might be, you know, people, you were here a year ago, and uh, you made some kind of commitment. And for you, I would say thank you. Look at what your gifts, on the financial side particularly, have enabled us to do. And so my word for you would be finish strong. Don't become weary in doing good, as the Bible says. Keep at it. Don't let up. Um, it's so, so important. You know, the Ravens are going to play the Seattle today. We don't want them to get the ball down to the 20 and just stop. We want to, what, get it across the finish line. And that's what I'm saying to you. If you've made a commitment already, way to go. I know it's made a difference in your life and faith. I can guarantee it's made a difference in someone else's. And uh, finish strong, okay? To a second group of people, I'm talking to those who maybe weren't here a year ago. Or for whatever reason, maybe you were here, but you just didn't join in. I just want to say, join us, will you? And, and by that I mean, you know, think about your answer to the will you trust me question as it relates to finances. So you can grow in your own faith and so that your part, small or large, can be added into the whole for mission impact. So join us. We really do need you. We probably could have hit the previous goal without you, but we stretched the goal. Now we really can't without you. So we need you. We want you to be able to experience the awe and some of the joy that people like Jeff and Kathy were talking about. And the, third, the third group would be maybe you were here a year ago and you made a commitment, but you kind of feel in your heart like it's not really drawing upon your faith. It's not something that you feel. Uh, it, you might need to revise or refresh your number, you know. Maybe your faith has grown. Maybe your finances have grown. Maybe auto draft has become autopilot, and you need to give in a way that you feel. And if that's the case, great. Revise and refresh that number in a way that is real and genuine for you and your family and your situation for this next year. And those three categories, I think, cover all of us one way or the other. And listen, I, you know, I know every time we talk about anything that has to do with like what Jesus teaches about the giving part of our faith, I know there's always skeptics who are like, oh boy, here we go, you know, and, you know, this is the church asking for money like it's somehow going to benefit us. And I, I understand, you know, why people think all of that. But, you know, I just want to say and be clear, you know, what we're really asking is everyone to be obedient to God, everyone to trust God and to bring the tithe that he asks for, to, to trust him enough to take him at his word and to, when he says he's going to provide and, um, we're just teaching the truth that we're blessed to be generous. And, um, and we are investing in all the things that God cares about. I mean, we make no apologies for the fact that we've reached thousands and we're going to reach thousands more by God's grace. We make no apologies for the kids we're going to reach. We make no apologies for the, what this money is used for to impact the community and around the world. Um, you know, if, if God asked us to bring the money and put it in a big cauldron here and burn it up as a sacrificial offering to him... I don't know if I'd like that as much. I'd still need to do it because he would need to show us how we need to trust him. But he doesn't ask us to do that. He asks us to give it actually then, and then he leverages it and uses it for incredible good that we all actually love being a part of, unstoppable good. So I hope maybe you can come to think about it that way if you're one of those skeptics. So pull out that card if you haven't right now. We're just going to give a moment 
some time to kind of reflect, you and God. Um, maybe if you're with a couple or something, you're going to take a moment. It's not going to be a long time. We're going to give a little moment of reflection. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to reflect. And then Cole will lead us. We'll stand up, and we're going to sing just a beautiful song of worship together. And as we do, there'll be kiosks set around. And everyone, just in your own time, you can make your way to the front and drop that card in and return to your seat. And uh, it's going to be a powerful, powerful time. And you can see the, the boxes there. They represent the three categories. The top, if you're just joining us, and the bottom, if you are, you know, if you're like, you know, I, I need to confirm that I'm going to finish strong or I'm going to revise or refresh uh, my gift. Now, one more thing. In the next moment when we're quiet, you'll notice there's something else on the seat next to you. And it's one of those bibs that looks like this. It's a race bib. It's your chance to go all in. Because, you know, in this moment where you're kind of reflecting on your blondin moment with God, like, are you going to get in the wheelbarrow? Uh, you also have an opportunity. This is a keepsake for you to take home. Just a reminder of how you're going to run with it this year. And you can maybe write these words, you know, write your name on it if you want. And maybe a prayer like, God, help me to be faithful in as you kind of maybe just finish that prayer. Maybe just write one sentence or maybe you want to write it on the back and put this someplace to remind you. Stick it in your Bible or leave it around somewhere. But just kind of a way to remind you, God, help me be faithful in or through. Help me to be faithful. How do you need to answer that prayer? And use that bib as a reminder of that, that you're going to run with it this next year. So first we'll just have a moment to kind of be... Um, quiet with our cards and, uh, and with the bibs. And then in a moment, Cole will lead us and we'll stand up and we'll bring these to the kiosk, okay? God, uh, will, will you be with us in this moment? Will you come and fill this moment, this place with your presence and help us to, um, and help us to get in the wheelbarrow, to really trust you with what matters most, to trust, us, to trust you with the loved one that we just don't have any control over, to trust you with that sin pattern that seems to have control over us, to trust you with the worries that keep us up at night, to trust that you are good, that you are faithful, that you will be with us always, to trust you with our treasure and to put it where we want our heart to be, and that is with you as first and foremost in our lives. Let these cards reflect all of that today as we worship you because you've been so, so good to us. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.